Okay, welcome. Uh, it's Sunday night, March 27th, 2022, and my name is Glenn Rawson. Welcome to our fireside tonight. Um, I was going to pre-record this for you, but it didn't work out with Adam and me. Things have gone on this week that precluded that. So here I am, live in front of the saddle, although I've changed up the background a little bit. I hope you are. Uh, I hope you like it. Uh, just a reminder, there are two Facebook pages that are broadcasting this fireside tonight. One of them is Glenn Ross and Stories, and the other one is History of the Saints. If you have not yet either liked or followed those two pages, please do. It would be a great help to us. Thank you to all of you who came yesterday to our Knowing Joseph seminar. This is the Place Heritage Park in Salt Lake. We had good reviews, great reports. The speakers were absolutely wonderful. And I walked away having spent a day with the Spirit of the Lord and hope and good doctrine. It just felt really good. The next one of those Knowing Joseph seminars is going to come off in Logan, uh, Cache Valley, Logan on May 21st, Saturday, May 21st. Those tickets are available now at historyofthesaints.org if you want to get them quickly and reserve your seat. This coming Saturday, I wanted to remind you, this coming Saturday uh, at 9.30 on KSL, and I will make it available later on after the broadcast here on the website, uh, historyofthesaints.org, and I'll put it on Facebook for you. This coming Saturday morning at 9.30, for all those of you here in Utah or who want to get on ksl.com, you can watch the History of the Saints special leading right into General Conference, the King Follett Discourse. That's this coming Saturday at 9.30 in the morning either KSL Channel 5 here in Utah or ksl.com. You can watch it either way. So tonight, I would invite you to have a prayer in your heart and to, um, and to think about what we're talking about this evening. The sincere desire of my heart is to help. And I hope after working over these stories all week long, I hope that there's something here that will be of use and benefit to you. And I hope you come out the other end of this fireside feeling better than when you came in. This first story. When the Lord's servants of any age, gender, or calling speak by the power and authority of the Holy Ghost, it is Scripture, the mind and will of the Lord himself. It may not be and oft times is not in the canon of Scripture but it is the word of the Lord and a word of wisdom. Hence, this story. Sunday afternoon, 3.15 p.m., April 7, 1844, in a grove about one quarter mile east of the temple in Nauvoo, Illinois. The occasion was the second day of the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith, Jr., church president and prophet, stood up and notwithstanding a strong wind blowing, commenced to deliver one of the greatest sermons of his life to an estimated audience of some 10,000 people. He asked for the prayers of the saints and then began to speak without notes. He began by saying, quote, I do not intend to please you with oratory, but with the simple truths of heaven edify you, end of quote. And those truths flowed in a profusion of doctrine that is estimated to have lasted more than two hours. The previous day, he had promised that he would prove to his enemies that God was still with him and surely he was, for no man could know what Joseph knew unless God had taught him. The ideas were simply not of this world. Joseph was the last speaker of the conference, and this talk came to be known as the King Fall at Discourse. The sermon was not named for a king, but was intended to remember and honor a Latter-day Saint named King Follett, 
who have been killed by a falling tub of rock when digging a well near his home in Nauvoo. At the actual funeral days before, Joseph had been asked to speak on Brother Follett's behalf, but for reasons unknown, he had said very little. Well, the family approached him again and asked him if he would take occasion sometime later and honor King Follett. Joseph chose to honor King Follett in a general conference address before the entire church. Now, if you have not read that discourse, I commend it to you highly. It seems altogether fitting to me that Joseph honored King Follett before the entire church, and that this address would come to be known after his name. Because you see, in this address, Joseph taught that God is an exalted, perfected man that dwells in yonder heavens, and that mere mortals, people like us, ordinary men and women, could become, given enough time and the grace of God, could become as God is ordinary men and women, just like King Follett. King Follett never served in any prominent positions in the church. He was never an apostle or anything of like a bishop or prophet or anything like that. He was just a good, faithful member of the church who had endured persecution, traveled with the church from place to place, gathered with the saints, and did his duty. He was faithful all the way from Kirtland to Nauvoo. It is as if King Follett, the common ordinary saint, represents all of us and our eternal possibilities outlined in this discourse. Now, four scribes recorded portions of Joseph's sermon. Their accounts were later combined to create as comprehensive a representation of the sermon as can be obtained on this side of the veil. There have been those who have felt that that sermon, Joseph's greatest, should be canonized as Scripture, that its truths are so pure and foundational that they should be part of the holy books. Indeed, whether you realize it or not, Latter-day Saints believe and teach the doctrine of that sermon wherein first revealed, even sometimes when they don't know where it came from. The King Follett Discourse represents Joseph Smith at his finest, and yet, so fitting, his enemies ridiculed its precepts while the faithful considered it the greatest they had ever heard. So it is today. That sermon more than any other, has brought down the wrath of the world upon our shoulders, calling and labeling it as blasphemy, even while its teachings have lifted the sights of the saints to the highest heavens and the greatest possibilities. If you would know who you are, where you came from, and what you can be, how long has it been? since you have studied the King Follett Discourse, delivered 178 years ago this next week. Next story. I'm indebted to my friend for this story who shared it with me just recently. The Lord once said, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you. Now behold, he said, this is the spirit of revelation. I have pondered that a great deal. The Lord speaks to me by my thoughts and by my feelings. No wonder it's so hard at times to tell who is speaking, me or him, because the thoughts and the feelings are mine. They sound the same. Thank heavens There are those times when there comes compelling nudges, a push from the Spirit, such as this. In June of 1984, my friend Jim Summers was on his way home from work when he passed a red pickup truck stopped in the middle of the street. He started around the truck when he noticed the driver 
of the truck kneeling down over a little boy prone in the street. Without thinking, Jim stopped and ran to the boy. He was just a toddler, less than two years old and wearing only a diaper. Jim said, This isn't something I normally do. I don't like trauma. I'm not trained and I'm not comfortable being around it. Nevertheless, he said, there I was. The boy had been chasing a puppy and the puppy had ran out into the street. The boy followed. He didn't see the pickup and the driver didn't see him. He was struck by the grill on his head and thrown forward. Then the truck ran over him across his chest. Jim said, quote, I still remember the track mark. The boy was ashen and not breathing. He looked dead, end quote. Standing nearby was a young girl screaming for someone to give him a priesthood blessing. Reaching into his pocket, Jim pulled out some oil and asked the boy's name. It's Tyler Abraham, the girl said. Jim anointed the child just as the ambulance pulled up. As he gave the boy a blessing, the EMTs ran up. Jim described the events that followed. Quote, I gave Tyler, I gave Tyler the blessing and sealed the anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. Just as I took my hands from Tyler's head, he moaned and started to move around. The EMT had his stethoscope on Tyler's chest as I finished the blessing and said at first there wasn't a heartbeat, but it started as soon as I closed the blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. They quickly loaded him in the ambulance and made the trip to the hospital in a few minutes. Jim said, I walked back to my truck and drove home. I was physically and emotionally drained. I got home a few minutes later and was greeted in the kitchen by my wife, who asked, What's the matter? I started to explain, but started weeping, and tried to tell her about what had happened. I finally finished the story and laid down to process what had just happened. Later that evening, he said, I drove down to the hospital and met his mother. She was in Tyler's room. I explained who I was and asked how he was doing. She said he was going to be fine. He had no broken bones, but suffered a concussion. The boy had to learn to walk again, but he was home the next day. End of quote. And that EMT, he had been taking the missionary lessons. He later told Jim that the boy was dead when he first got to him. He described the EMT how he felt life come back into Tyler as Jim finished the blessing. The EMT was baptized shortly after. And perhaps the most powerful part of this story is Jim's take on the whole experience. He said, quote, I don't feel that I'm anyone special. I sin. I make mistakes. I'm just a guy that listened to the Spirit as I went by the truck. I'm sure most people would do the same. But I think that's the point, he said. Regular, normal people can make a big difference in the lives of others if we will just listen to the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. End of quote. And just one last thing. About 30 years after the accident, Tyler and Jim were reunited. Tyler is now married and with three children and living a happy family life. Jim, thank you for sharing that story. The intent of President Brigham Young and his brethren of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was to depart Nauvoo in February 1846 and make it to the Rocky Mountains that same season. When they crossed the Mississippi and started west, one of the first, if not the first, to depart 
as an advance scout was Charles Shumway, who crossed the Mississippi River with his wagons on barges and began the journey west to the mountains. Well, as you may know the story, the crossing of Iowa proved painfully slow and difficult due to weather and road conditions and so forth. President Young and the Saints did not reach the Missouri River until June 1846. And as soon as they got there, then came the recruitment of the Mormon Battalion to serve in the United States Army in their war with Mexico. With the loss of some of their best and strongest men and the lateness of the season, it was decided that the Saints would make winter quarters on the west bank of the Missouri River and continue on to the Rocky Mountains the following season. However, several families had been sent on ahead by President Young to try and reach the mountains that same season. Among them was Charles Shumway and his family. Now, it was October 1846, and these hardy pioneers, Brother Shumway and others, were camped among the Pawnee Indian tribe on the Loop Fork River in Nebraska. As they were camped there, one night there came a knock at the door of Brother Shumway's cabin. A voice called out, Shumway. Two men entered the cabin with a message from President Brigham Young. Quoting, For all companies camped at the Pawnee villages to move immediately back to winter quarters. Reliable intelligence has been received from mountain men and from knowledgeable Indian sources that the Sioux are preparing to again attack the Pawnee tribes, striking first at the missions, the government station, and the fort. There is no time to spare. They may strike at day's first light tomorrow morning. End of quote. Charles and the others immediately sprang into action, loading their wagons and yoking up their oxen. Long before daybreak, they were on their way east back to winter quarters. They had gone about 12 miles where they found a high eminence and stopped to rest their teams. Looking back to the west, they saw black clouds of billowing smoke rising above the horizon. Quoting, The Sioux had attacked, and the fort and all the rest of the buildings on both banks of the river were on fire. The entire Pawnee campsite where the Shumways had been was a fire. End of quote. In later years, when remembering the close encounter with the warring Indian tribes, Charles and his wife would tell their family that this experience had taught them to listen to the words of the prophet of God and follow without question. End of quote. My dear friends, I don't know much, but I have a conviction that if we will listen to the living prophets, seers, and revelators, we will have no need to fear. We will be prepared for whatever comes and that we will come out in the end on the winning side. Now, if I may stop for just a moment, I haven't heard anything from Adam or from Annie, so I think we're okay. I wanted to stop down for a minute and again, take occasion to read you a passage out of Tempering Steel. I've really enjoyed this, and evidently from the comments I've gotten back from some of you, you don't mind having a bedtime story read to you either. So if you'll give me just a second. Quoting, All evening, Shawnee had seemed tense, like she was holding back. 
and he thought he knew why, which only frustrated him all the more. There was something powerful between them. He felt it like he never had before, and he perceived that she did as well, but she was stifling it, and that was what frustrated him. He sensed the edge of the dunes. This takes place in the sand dunes west of Rexburg, Idaho. This is called dune jumping, if you've never done it. He sensed the edge of the dune and kicked harder for speed. Suddenly, the brink appeared. He leaped out and up in the darkness, gravity carrying him down the slope almost to the bottom. He landed perfectly in the sand with his feet striking and throwing a large cloud of sand up in front of him. He turned around and took two steps toward the top just as Shawnee leaped the edge. J.O. stopped and stared. Directly behind her, the rising moon caught her in full silhouette, its brilliant silver light backlighting her lithe, slender form like an actress on a stage. The momentary effect created the illusion of an angel descending from heaven toward him. Her long, blonde hair streamed behind her, its color a luminescent silver. It was an electrifying image he would never forget. Unconsciously, he caught his breath. He had never seen anyone or anything more beautiful in his life. How could it be that he would see something like this twice. There was not a sound as she flew toward him. She landed about three feet up the slope from where he stood. Her balance was slightly off, and her momentum catapulted her forward nearly headlong. She threw out her arms to catch herself. Rather than step aside, J.O. squared himself and caught her by the shoulders. But her momentum carried her deep into his arms and against his chest. I've got you, he said, his strong grip holding her firmly. The book, Tempering Steel, is available at historyofthesaints.org and also at glenrossonstories.com. I thought you might be interested to know it's available at Kindle, and it's also available as an audio book at audible.com. You can get it other place, and it will soon be in Deseret Book. It's coming. All right, thank you. Thank you for letting me share that with you. I I have so much fun reading that. Well, quoting now this next portion, the man said, When I was about 21, I married a very agreeable companion, lived with her about one year when she died, leaving one child, which we named Harriet. After the death of my wife, I had some anxiety about her state and condition. Consequently, in answer to my desires in a few weeks, she came to me in vision and appearing natural, looked pleasant as she ever did, and sat by my side and assisted me in singing a hymn, beginning thus, he said. That glorious day is drawing nigh when Zion's light shall, sh- shall shine. End of quote. This she did, he said, with a seeming composure. This vision took away all the anxiety of my mind concerning her, inasmuch as she seemed to enjoy herself well. End of quote. That story? Zera Pulsifer. Now, when that occurred, this was long before the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the earth. Zara would later learn of the hymn's greater meaning when he became acquainted with the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. But for the time, he said, quote, my mind became calm as respecting her condition, his deceased wife, in the spirit world, end of quote. Well, time went on, Zara married again and continued having a family. He moved to New York State. It was there in 1831 that he first heard mention of the Gold Bible, 
the Book of Mormon. Not long after that, he obtained a copy of the book and he read it through twice. Not long after, Elder Jared Carter came into the area where he lived and declared the Book of Mormon to be, quote, a revelation from God, end of quote. Well, hearing that, Zarah Pulsifer said, listen to this, I was determined to have that knowledge for myself, which I considered it my privilege to have. From that time, he said, I made it a matter of fervent prayer. I think about the seventh day, he continues, as I was thrashing in my barn with doors shut, all at once, there seemed to be a ray of light from heaven which caused me to stop work for a short time. But soon, it began again. Then in a few minutes, he said, another light came over my head which caused me to look up. I thought I saw the angels of God with the Book of Mormon in their hands in the attitude of showing it to me and saying, this is the great revelation of the last days in which all things spoken of by the prophets must be fulfilled, end of quote. The vision was so plain, so open, Sarah said, that I began to rejoice exceedingly so that I walked the length of my barn crying, glory, hallelujah to God and the Lamb forever. For some time, he continued, it seemed difficult to keep my mind in a proper state of reasonable order. I was filled with the joys of heaven. End of quote. Zarah Pulsifer was baptized, gathered with the saints. He went from place to place as the saints moved. He served multiple missions. One of those who heard him preach and was baptized not long after was a young man of great promise, Wilford Woodruff. Zarah Pulsifer and his family immigrated to Utah, and he lived out his days in southern Utah and died January 1st, 1872, at the age of 82. He was serving as a patriarch when he passed away. There's something about that story that just sticks with me. Not only is it that we live in the presence of the dead and the spirit world is very close, but also it is this. It is our privilege to know that the Book of Mormon is true. The Lord once said, because of the faith of our fathers, their word shall proceed forth out of my mouth unto their brethren. Meaning, because those ancient Nephites were so faithful and tried so hard to keep a record to influence their brethren in the future, the Lord said, their words written in the Book of Mormon will come forth out of my mouth. And so they have. I, for one, know that the Book of Mormon is true and that it is the power and great revelation of the last days. Next story. In 1840, members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were called and were laboring in the British Isles, attempting with all their might to bring souls to Christ, and they were very successful. While they were there, they experienced great opposition from both sides of the veil. On the night of October 18, 1840, Elder Wilford Woodruff and Elder George A. Smith of the Twelve were serving in London. Elder Woodruff wrote the following in his journal on that night. He said, quote, We retired to rest in good season, and I felt well in my mind and slept until about twelve at night. I awoke and meditated upon the things of God until near three o'clock, and while forming a determination 
to warn the people of London and overcome the powers of darkness by the assistance of God, a person appeared unto me, which I considered was the prince of darkness or the devil. Elder Woodruff said, He made war with me and attempted to take my life. He caught me by the throat and choked me nearly to death. He wounded me in my forehead. I also wounded him in a number of places in the head. As he was about to overcome me, I prayed to the Father in the name of Jesus for help. I then had power over him, and he left me, though much wounded. Now listen to this next part. Three personages dressed in white came to me and prayed with me, and I was immediately healed and delivered from all my troubles. End of, end of quote. George A. Smith was also there, and his account, he adds the following. It seemed as if there were legions of spirits there. They sought our destruction. These powers of darkness fell upon us to destroy our lives, and both of us would have been killed, apparently, had not three holy messengers come into the room with light. They were dressed in temple clothing. They laid their hands upon our heads, and we were delivered, and that power was broken so far as we were concerned. End of quote. Oh, that story gives me hope that those on the other side can stand in our defense against the evils of this world. We do not fight alone. You've heard it said, you are not alone. I witness that it's true. We are not alone. And even if we can't see those who are fighting on our behalf, they are nonetheless there. Last story for tonight. After the Savior's resurrection, he appeared to his apostles in the upper room there in Jerusalem, manifesting before them a real, physical, and corporeal body to them. Eight days later, he came similarly and this time appeared to Thomas. Sometime after these profound and eternal events, Simon Peter and four others were at the Sea of Galilee up north when Peter announced, quote, I go a-fishing. Those who were with him said, We also go with thee. End of quote. That's John chapter 21, verse 3. Well, the four men spent the rest of the night fishing in the familiar waters of the Sea of Tiberias. Peter, James, and John had earned their livelihood fishing these waters. It was from those shores years before that Jesus had called them to follow him and be fishers of men. You remember that? With the great haul of fish. And they pulled it to shore and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, three, three and a half years later, they were home again back on the shores of the lake. And the mortal ministry of the Messiah was over. Could they have been wondering? What do we do now? They fished the lake all that night, and they caught nothing. The following morning, a stranger was standing on shore at daylight, and he called out to them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. John 21. Well, they did, as the stranger bid them. Does this sound familiar? And immediately their nets were filled with so many fish, they could not draw them in. It was exactly what the Lord had done to them more than three years earlier. At that moment, they recognized him. It was the master. When they got to shore, they did not say a word. Jesus had a meal of cooked fish and bread waiting for them. As they finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, 
Lovest thou me more than these? What are these? Well, could it be that right here at this point in the record, he's either holding up or gesturing to the catch of fish? Peter answered him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Without any preamble, Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked the question again, Lovest thou me? And Peter's answer was the same, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. This time the Lord responded, Feed my sheep. Then a third time the Lord asked the same question, Lovest thou me? The scripture says that Peter was grieved that the same question had been asked of him three times. Why was the Lord repeatedly asking him a question for which he already knew the answer? Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Once more came the simple command, feed my sheep. The repetition of three made a memory in Peter that he never forgot, and in us. When the Lord wants to emphasize something and have it not be forgotten, he will say it three times. Once before, by a miracle, the Lord had called Simon Peter from his nets. Now, similarly, he was calling him away from those nets again and back to the work by the same miracle. Except this time, the work would end in Peter's death, not the Lord's. At the same time, Jesus taught the man of rock and all of us a disciple's purpose in this life. What are we born to do? What are we born to be? Our love for the Lord is measured by our love for others. A man or woman filled with the love of God cannot rest. They must move. They must act. They must love by their actions. To love him is to love his children. There are so many things we can do with our time each day, but of them all, helping our families and his lambs and his sheep pleases him the most. He pays the highest dividends of joy to those who invest their time in his sheep. What are you born to do? To bear testimony that God lives and that he is with us. To bear testimony that Jesus is the Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, and the Son of the living God, and bring souls unto him. What were you born to do? To bear testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith as his prophet, and of the covenants of the holy temple, and bring souls to the temple and thus to the Savior. Good night. God bless you. And I'll see you this next week on live broadcasts.